Welcome to Curious Apollo. This is a weekly show from Apollo Podcasts. In Curious Apollo, we will feed our curiosity by answering questions about science, history, space, and anything else that might pique our curiosity. There will be no questions about politics and celebrities in this show, only about things that matter. And besides, there's nothing amazing on that front anymore. So welcome to episode one from Curious Apollo. In today's episode, we will answer the following questions. In science, we will answer the question, did they have anesthesia in World War I? And in technology, we will answer the question, what is cloud computing? And in brain and neuroscience, we will answer the question, do our memories work like a computer's hard disk drive? And in biology, we will answer the question, do we really have more than five senses? And for our planet Earth question today, we will ask and answer the question, what triggers an earthquake? And for our space section, we will ask, what is dark matter? And for our myths and legends section, we will ask, who was Jason? And for our unforgettable people section, we will ask the question, who was Alan Turing? And we will finish by a featured topic from history and we will talk about the history of World War One. So let's get to it and let's start with our first question. Did they have anesthesia in World War One? To answer this question, maybe we should look at a little bit background about anesthesia in the first place. It is difficult to imagine how anyone endured a tooth extraction much less a limb amputation, before the age of anesthesia. A key qualification for surgeons back then was speed. In addition, attendants had to be strong enough to restrain the patient's agonized writhing. By the early 1840s, physicians had no better methods for dulling surgical pains than to stupefy the patient with a kind of hypnosis known as mesmerism, or indeed with whiskey. A turning point came in 1844 when Connecticut dentist Horace Wells attended a demonstration of nitrous oxide's intoxicating effects. Wells thought of using the so-called laughing gas during invasive procedures when he noticed one participant has scraped his leg badly but had suffered no pain. Like others before him, the anesthetic properties of nitrous oxide had been recognized for decades. Wells failed to develop the idea beyond an unsuccessful demonstration at Massachusetts General Hospital, where the patient cried out as his tooth was pulled. The eureka moment would be left to Wells' associate, dentist William Morton, in 1846. While working with Ether, Morton seized the opportunity to work on a patient with an infected tooth. He etherized the man, extracted his bicuspid, and when the patient awakened a few minutes later, announced to the patient's astonishment that the procedure was done. Venturing another demonstration at Massachusetts General, Morton anesthetized a patient undergoing surgery on a neck tumor. After the procedure, the initially skeptical surgeon turned to the audience and announced, Gentlemen, this is no humbug. So the answer to our question, yes, they had anesthesia in World War I because the first successful demonstration with anesthesia was done in 1846. And now for our technology section. What is cloud computing? Everybody is talking about cloud computing nowadays and we usually nod and say, yes, of course, and it's very important and it's a, a great idea. But do you really know what cloud computing is? Let's find out. In the past, computing relied on a physical infrastructure, routers, data pipes, hardware, and servers. These items have not gone away, nor are they likely to disappear altogether, but the process of delivering resources and services is moving to a model whereby the internet is used to store the necessary applications. An immediate benefit of this model is lower cost. For example, companies no longer have to buy individual software licenses for every employee. With cloud computing, a single application gives multiple users remote access to the software. Web-based email, such as Google's Gmail, is an example of cloud computing. To understand the concept of cloud computing, it helps to think in terms of layers the front-end layers and what users see and interact with, a Facebook account, for example. 
The back end consists of the user interface on the front end. Because the computers are set up in a network, the applications can take advantage of all the combined computing power as if they were running on one particular machine. While there are advantages to this model, it is not without drawbacks. Privacy and security are two of the biggest concerns. After all, a company is allowing important, potentially sensitive data to reside on the internet, where in theory anyone could access it. The companies that provide cloud computing services, however, are highly motivated to guarantee privacy and security. Their reputation are at stake. An authentication system that employs usernames and passwords or other types of authorization helps to ensure privacy. So this is in brief what cloud computing is. And of course, if you want to talk about cloud computing, you may go on for hours and hours to talk about all the details. But what we really need to know from that is that cloud computing is not some magical thing that happens in the air or in the actual cloud. There is hardware involved, but the applications that reside in the internet make it a lot easier to people to access it from all over the world, and they do not depend on one single computer. They can use multiple computers to power this application, which makes it a lot stronger. I hope that answers the question even partially about what cloud computing is. And now we will move to our brain and neuroscience section. Our question is, do our memories work like a computer's hard disk drive? You may ask yourself, oh, so how does a hard disk drive work anyway? Well, it stores the information in a limited space. And when this hard drive is full, you have to erase some memories to put new ones. So do our memories work the same way? Do we have to erase some memories to put others or is it unlimited? And the hard disk drive in a computer is a permanent storage device. So when you store information there, they stay there until you erase them or something wrong happens to the hard drive. It's different from the RAM, which is the random access memory and that works on a temporary basis. So how does our memory work? Is it more like the random access memory thing? Is it a temporary thing? But then we have those long-term memories. So let's find out and know more about how our memories work. Without memory, people would live in a never ending now with no idea of where they have been or where they might go. The memory of representations of the world gives humans the unique ability to think about the past, present, and future. Scientists who study memory find it a tough nut to crack. Neural circuits responsible for memories lie scattered throughout the brain. Experts have found some brain regions to be particularly crucial. However, the hippocampus, so-called because it resembles a seahorse, plays a significant role in emotion and memory. Lying deep in the forebrain, it receives sensory data from the senses and integrates them into a single experience. And now we come to the important thing. We have the working and long-term memory. Now, some memories last less than a minute and some last a lifetime. Working memory, a type of short-term memory, holds sensations for a few seconds. You remember the last few words you spoke or the last few ingredients you put in the stew so you may complete the tasks you have begun then working memory clears and you move on. Long-term memory is more like a filing cabinet. Some documents from a computer screen or tabletop get filed for later use. Information is more likely to make the transition from working to long-term memory if you pay particular attention to it. Repeatedly try to remember it or associate it with strong emotions. These memories are useful not as much for navigating through the moment as for making good choices and succeeding at life. Now, there's no question that some of us have stronger memories than others, but there is evidence everywhere that we can work on our memories to make them a lot better than we think they are. And the first thing we need to know is that we can transform those short-term temporary memories to long-term permanent memories if we focus more, if we pay attention to what we are learning, and a little repetition does help. And now let's move to the next section, which is biology. The question we have today is, do we really have more than five senses? Let's figure that out. Now, we all know the five senses, of course, but some people talk about six or seven or even 10 senses. Is that really scientific or is it just like a myth? So let's find out more about the senses we have. Now, when asked to name the senses, most people list five. 
touch, vision, hearing, smell, and taste. But physiologists group them differently. The general senses include the tactile sensations of touch, pressure, pain, and vibration. The special senses are vision, smell, taste, hearing, and balance. All of them associated with special receptor cells in the head. Of all the special senses, vision is probably the most important. The eyes contain about 70% of the body's sensory receptors, and nearly half the cerebral cortex is given over to visual processing. The special senses of taste and smell are close partners. Both are chemical senses, registering their sensations through chemoreceptors that detect chemicals dissolved in solution. Taste is said to be limited to five basic qualities, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, which is meaty. But receptors inside the nasal cavity can detect at least 10,000 different odors. The curling fluid-filled structures of our inner ears are responsible for two senses, hearing and equilibrium. Equilibrium monitors posture, the position of the body, especially the head, relative to gravity, and straight line acceleration, such as the sudden forward movement of a car. So it might be okay to say that we have five senses, but according to physiologists, it is not the case. Remember that they have the general senses, and these are the tactile. Touch is one of them, this is one we know, but the new senses we might not have known before, the pressure, pain, vibration, and balance. These are four new senses for us. I didn't know about those. I knew about just two of them. And here, before we go to the next section, I read something while I was preparing this that is really useful and, and really important nowadays, especially with the MP3 players and everybody having their earphones in their ears all the time. So you might want to hear about this. You might know this, but trust me, it is very harmful. And you don't want to lose those tiny hairs inside of your ear because that will really take the joy of music away. So let's get to this piece of advice. Now the tiny hair cells that register vibration in your ear are fragile instruments. It doesn't take much noise to damage them permanently, leaving them among the 15% of Americans with noise-induced hearing loss. Noise level above 85 decibels do that kind of damage. Lawn mowers, hair dryers, motorcycles, and chainsaws can top this limit, but so can movie theater sound systems, nightclubs, and rock concerts. Among the most insidious culprits are earbuds attached to MP3 players. Because they may play music in your ears for hours, these players can reach up to 115 decibels, and because earbuds are inefficient transmitters, people often turn them up to the max. As a rule of thumb, if other people can hear your music when you have earbuds in, or if you can't hear any other noise through the sound, you're damaging your hearing. Keep MP3 players at no more than 60% of their maximum volume or indulge in a pair of noise-canceling headphones, which transmit sound at lower levels to better effect. So this is for all of you people, especially the ones who are listening to this podcast right now. Take very good care of the tiny hair cells that you have in your ears. Losing some may not sound like a big deal, but you are actually losing the ability of catching all those nice frequencies we have in music. And we don't want to lose those. We don't want to be in a place where we can just get some of the frequencies out there. And now let's move to the next section. And it is about our planet Earth. The question we have today is what triggers an earthquake? So let's find out. The earthquake that struck in 2011 off the east coast of Honshu, Japan's largest island, was a nightmare come to life. The magnitude 9 degrees Richter quake and resulting 97 foot high, which is 30 meters tsunami, killed more than 15,000 people and destroyed more than 300,000 buildings. No one predicted the quake because no one could. Scientists know the basic mechanism of earthquakes. Simply put, for earthquakes not related to a volcanic eruption, two blocks of earth sliding along a fault line build up energy from friction and then suddenly release it when a block overcomes the friction and jolts forward. The energy then moves in waves through the ground, shaking the surface. Many mysteries remain, however. Why, for instance, does the friction suddenly ease? 
Does the rock become molten along the fault or powdery like talc? Why are so many earthquakes minor when lab simulations predict they should be devastating? Pressure from water in reservoirs or wastewater injected into the ground during natural gas drilling seem to sometimes trigger quakes. But how? And are these quakes dangerous? We don't have firm answers to these questions and science is still at a loss to predict the next disaster. So what we know about quakes is not a lot actually. We know how they work when they work, but what triggers them and why they are triggered and can we really predict the magnitude of an earthquake? Well, unfortunately not really. And we can't do that before it happens so we can avert the disaster and evacuate the cities in time. We usually figure that out when it's actually too late. So unfortunately, we don't have a clear answer to this question, but at least we've learned a little bit more about earthquakes. And now for space, we have this dark matter thing. Everybody talks about dark matter. We even had it in some science fiction movies. But what is dark matter actually? And is it real? Because if you search for dark matter over the internet, there's a lot of controversy. A lot of people do not even believe there is dark matter. But our quest today is not to believe or disbelieve in dark matter. We just need to know what it is. So let's get to it. Now it started a long time ago when Swiss astronomer Fritz Zwicky, studying rotating galaxy clusters in the 1930s, came to an unsettling conclusion. At the speeds he observed, the clusters should be flinging their stars into space like unfortunate children who had lost their grip on a merry-go-round. The only way the clusters could be holding together would be if contained much more mass than anyone had seen. Later measurements of galactic motion cemented the mystery of dark matter. Physicists now believe that about 27% of the matter in the universe consists of this unknown substance, which doesn't emit or reflect light. Dark matter might consist of ordinary unseen objects such as massive brown dwarf stars and black holes. Scientists have a second candidate though, weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. These exotic particles would have very little mass individually and therefore be hard to detect, but could be so numerous and widespread that they would have the required gravitational effect. Experiments aboard the International Space Station have detected high energy particles that might, maybe just possibly, have been cast off by the collision of particles of dark matter. So, what is dark matter? Nobody really knows except for these hypotheses, but that is what we need to know about it for now, and who knows, it might be a mystery we will find a solution for in the coming years. So be on the lookout for any news about dark matter, and if you learn anything, let me know. And now we move to the place where we have stories, and to be honest, this is my favorite place, especially when it comes to Greek mythology, which is our question for today. And our question for today is, who was Jason? I'm sure everybody knows about Hercules, maybe Perseus because of the movies we have, and Achilles, of course, if you've watched Troy, but not a lot know about Jason, one of the major Greek heroes from Greek mythology. So let's learn more about the son of Aeson. Now, Jason in Greek mythology, who was a son of Aeson, a king in Greece, Aeson's throne had been taken away from him by his half-brother Peleus, and Jason, the rightful heir to the throne, had been sent away as a child for his own protection. When Jason grew to manhood, however, he courageously returned to Greece to regain his kingdom. Pelias pretended to be willing to relinquish the crown, but said that the young man must first undertake the quest of the Golden Fleece, which was the rightful property of their family. Pelias did not believe that Jason could succeed in the quest, nor that he would come back alive. But the young man scoffed at the dangers ahead, Jason assembled a crew of heroic young men from all parts of Greece to sail with him on the ship Argo. After a voyage of incredible perils, the Argonauts reached Colchis, the country in which the Golden Fleece was held by King Aetus. Aetus agreed to give up the Golden Fleece if Jason would yoke two fire-breathing bulls with bronze feet and sow the teeth of the dragon that Cadmus, the founder of Thebes, had long before slain. From the teeth would spring up a crop of armed men who would turn against Jason. Jason successfully accomplished this task with the aid of Medea, the king's daughter, 
Unknown to Jason, the goddess Hera had intervened in his behalf by making Medea fall in love with him. Medea gave Jason a charm to sprinkle on his weapons that would make him invincible for the day of his ordeal and helped him steal the fleece that night by charming a sleepless dragon that guarded it. In return for her help, Jason promised to love Medea always and to marry her as soon as they were safely back in Greece. Carrying the fleece and accompanied by Medea, Jason and his crew managed to escape from Aetis. On reaching Greece, the crew of heroes disbanded and Jason with Medea took the golden fleece to Pelias. In Jason's absence, Pelias had forced Jason's father to kill himself and his mother had died of grief. To avenge their death, Jason called upon Medea to help him punish Pelias. Medea tricked Pelias' daughters into killing their father, and then she and Jason went to Corinth, where two sons were born to them. Instead of feeling grateful to Medea for all she had done, Jason treacherously married the daughter of the king of Corinth. In her grief and despair, Medea employed more sorcery to kill the young bride. Next, fearing that her young sons might be left alone for strangers to mistreat, she killed them. When the furious Jason determined to kill her, she escaped in a chariot drawn by dragons. So it is a story of killing and treachery, but that is most of the stories we have from the Greek mythology. And the beauty of Greek mythology is that most of the stories we have from those olden times are still being used today in modern movies, and they are used in a lot of fantasy novels. Maybe not directly, but a lot of the stories are assembled from here and there, sometimes from different myths that come from different parts of the world, and are put in one place in a novel or in a film, or sometimes in a series, like the famous Game of Thrones. And now we come to our unforgettable people section, and our question for today is who was Alan Turing? If you haven't seen The Imitation Game yet, it's a movie obviously, if you haven't seen it yet, definitely go and see it, one of the must-see movies. It talks a lot about the life of Alan Turing, a man known in the scientific world a long time before the movie came out, and the secrets that were held from the public for a long time were not revealed until very recently. So let's learn more about who Alan Turing was. Alan Turing was born in 1912 and died in 1954. He was a British mathematician who was considered one of the most important founders of computer science and artificial intelligence. He was the first to describe in detail a machine that could carry out mathematical operations and solve equations. His work brought together symbolic logic, numerical analysis, electrical engineering, and mechanical vision of human thought processes. Alan Matheson Turing was born in London. He had a conventional school education. Early on, he developed a passion for science. He became a student in mathematics, but also gathered ideas from philosophy and physics. Early letters show how a concern for the problem of the mind was given emotional weight by the death of a dearly loved school friend. In 1935, Turing entered King's College at Cambridge University. Inspired by problems left outstanding by the work of Kurt Gödel in The Foundation of Mathematics, Turing began combining symbolic logic with an original analysis of mental activity. His paper on computable numbers in 1937 introduced the abstract Turing machine to define the concept of a fixed computational method or algorithm. He also introduced the universal Turing machine, a single machine capable of performing any instructions given to it. He thereby solved a major mathematical problem called decidability. His work opened up the new theory of computability, which means what a computing device can do, and laid out the principles of the modern computer. He earned his PhD at Princeton University in the United States in 1938, then returned to England. Turing's mathematical career was overtaken by World War II, that happened from 1939 to 1945. He became a cryptographer for the British Foreign Office and excelled at applying scientific ideas to code breaking, which is cryptography. Most famously, he constructed a machine to help break the German naval Enigma cipher. His successful deciphering of the code provided a tool to track German ships in the Atlantic, an advantage critical to the victory of the Allies in the war. Turing was awarded the Order of the British Empire for his work. 
In 1946, Turing used his experience with electronic technology to translate his abstract universal Turing machine into a detailed design for a digital computer. American researchers had already made similar proposals, but Turing's design was far ahead in grasping the scope of new technology. The National Physical Laboratory, where he was working, failed to take practical steps to build his proposed machine. In 1948, Turing moved to the University of Manchester to pioneer the use of the computer developed there. Turing held that a computer was capable in principle of doing anything that the brain can do. His 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, set forth a theory that remains a cornerstone of the science of artificial intelligence. The test that Turing proposed involved a computer communicating with human judges via a teleprinter link. If the computer's responses to questions were indistinguishable from those of a human being, Turing claimed the computer should be regarded as exhibiting intelligence. The Turing test for machine intelligence had a lasting influence in the philosophy of mind and still provokes discussion. In 1951, Turing was named a Fellow of the Royal Society. The next year, he began to publish his work on the mathematical aspects of pattern and form development in living organisms. Events in Turing's personal life effectively ended his career, however. In 1952, he stood trial for having had a homosexual relationship, which was considered a crime in Britain back then. He was classed as a security risk and accepted injections of estrogen to avoid imprisonment. He was open about his homosexuality and unashamed of it. However, homosexuality was then considered a mental illness and he sought Jungian therapy. In 1954, Turing died of cyanide poisoning. Although the circumstances of his death were not clear, the verdict was suicide. So, it was not exactly how it was brought up in the movie, but it is pretty close. And remember, when you watch the story of somebody's life on TV, in a movie or something, it always exaggerates some parts and it overlooks some other parts to create this dramatic effect that will serve the movie. But anyway, it was pretty close and it is a, an excellent movie if you want to watch it. So before we move to our featured topic of today, which is World War I, let us remember what questions we've answered today. Our first question was, did they have anesthesia in World War I? Our second question was, what is cloud computing? Our third question from Brain and Neuroscience was, do our memories work like a computer's hard drive? And our question from Biology was, do we really have more than five senses? Our question from Planet Earth was, what triggers an earthquake? And what is dark matter? Our question from Space, and who was Jason from Greek mythology? And finally, who was Alan Turing? And that is from our Unforgettable People section. Now we will move to our history section with our feature topic, World War I. In 1914, Europe stumbled into a catastrophic war that lasted for more than four years and claimed the lives of millions of soldiers and civilians. The causes of World War I are complex and multifaceted. They have stirred debate among historians and laymen alike ever since the war ground to a halt in 1918. It seems clear, however, that the outbreak of the war was an unintended consequence of an extremely tense international order in which the great powers of Europe eyed each other with varying degrees of hatred, envy, fear, and suspicion. The event that detonated this powder keg was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary at Sarajevo on June 28, 1914. This act of political terror infuriated Austria, which concluded that Serbia, a small Balkan country, was behind the assassination. When Austria threatened Serbia, the Serb government appealed for protection to its ally, Russia. Meanwhile, Austria received strong encouragement for its confrontational stance from its ally, Germany. As the crisis deepened, Russia consulted with its ally, France, and France, in turn, entered into discussion with its friend, Great Britain. When Austria sent an ultimatum to Serbia and the antiquated Russian army began to mobilize, the dominoes fell. By early August 1914, World War I had begun. 
In light of the terrible destruction that followed, it is interesting to note that not only the European governments, but also their population went to war with great enthusiasm. Huge crowds filled the streets of Europe's capital cities, wildly cheering the declarations of war. Not only was this first general war since Napoleon's campaigns of 100 years earlier greeted with enthusiasm, there was also a universal conviction that the war would be a short one and that the boys would be home by Christmas. As the war progressed, more and more countries became involved. At the start, however, the major combatants were on one side Germany and Austria-Hungary, which together with their allies would be known as the Central Powers, and on the other side, Great Britain, France, and Russia, which together with their allies would be known as the Allied Powers or Allies. From the start, the Central Powers found themselves fighting a two-front war. That is, they were forced to fight simultaneously in both the West and the East. Aware of the grave dangers inherent in a two-front war, the German general staff had drawn up the Schleifen Plan, which called for Germany in the event of war to mass the bulk of its army in the West in order to deliver a quick and devastating knockout blow to the French. After defeating the French, the German army could turn its attention to the east and destroy the Russian army at its leisure. Employing the Schleifen plan, the Germans came very close to capturing Paris in the first month of the war. They were barely stopped at the first battle of the Marne, when the French took advantage of gaps in the German lines caused by the transfer of some German units from the Western Front to the Eastern Front, where the Russians had unexpectedly mounted an offensive. Ironically, these German troops were not crucial to the outcome in the East. Although the Russians, under General Alexander Samsonov and Pamel Renenkampf, had moved westward into the German territory of East Prussia, their attack was so confused and poorly coordinated that a smaller German force defeated both Russian armies at the twin battles of Tannenberg and the Majorian Lakes. These huge German victories in the East focused the spotlight on generals Erich Ludendorff and Paul von Hindenburg, two of the most effective military commanders in a war notable for undistinguished, if not abominable, military leadership. The failure of the German offensive in the West and of the Russian offensive in the East shattered all illusions about the war being a short one. Instead, both sides settled in for a protracted struggle featuring trench warfare. Trench warfare called for each side to concentrate great numbers of men in a series of parallel fortified ditches or trenches and to attack in massed formations in the hope of breaching the enemy's lines. Those on the defensive would exploit their dug-in positions to repel the offensive. The nature of trench warfare with its massed assaults into the teeth of trench defensive positions resulted in truly appalling casualty figures. World War I quickly became a war of attrition in which each side readily sacrificed incredible numbers of its own men in order to exhaust the enemy, bleed them white, and thus achieve history. During 1915, the war on the Western Front witnessed wave after wave of British, French, and German soldiers attacking across barren, no-man's land into the face of entrenched machine gun nests. Although the casualty figures skyrocketed, the front barely moved. Much of the military action in that year took place on the Eastern Front, having failed to destroy France in 1914, the Central Powers in 1915 sought to drive Russia from the war. In a series of coordinated attacks, the Central Powers regained Galicia, expelled Russia from Poland and Lithuania, and invaded Russia proper. However, victory proved elusive. Although the Russian army was poorly led, poorly equipped, poorly fed, and beaten on the battlefield, it nevertheless relied on its seemingly unlimited supply of men and the vast expanses of the Russian countryside to remain in the field as a viable foe. During the first months of hostilities in the East, it became obvious that Austria-Hungary was not up to the military task at hand. Austria-Hungary's offensives, even against tiny Serbia, failed, and often Germany had to come to its rescue when the Russians pummeled its army. Consequently, by 1916, Austria-Hungary had virtually surrendered its freedom of action to Germany, 
and it was relegated to this inferior position until the end of the war. In 1915, the Western Allies, France and Great Britain, invaded Turkey, which had entered the war on the side of the Central Powers in October 1914. This attack, known as the Gallipoli Campaign, and fought chiefly by soldiers from the British Empire, ended in defeat for the Allies. Nevertheless, the Allies now determined to destroy the Ottoman Empire. By virtue of a secret treaty concluded in 1915, Russia was granted the right to fulfill its long-standing desire to annex Constantinople and thereby gain control over the straits leading from the Black Sea to the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean. Subsequently, the British led by Colonel T. E. Lawrence successfully incited the Turkish Empire's Arab populations. In 1917, the British issued the Balfour Declaration, pledging themselves to support the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. As the British were becoming bogged down in Gallipoli, Italy having been promised territorial gains at the expense of Austria-Hungary, entered the war on the side of the Allies in May 1915. Also during the early stages of the war, the Allies, especially Great Britain, moved against Germany's African colonies. Japan, Britain's Pacific ally, grabbed Germany's colonies in Asia and the South Pacific. In 1916, while the armies of the Central Powers slowly chewed up the fading Russian army, the military spotlight shifted to the West once again. In particular, two battles on the Western Front that year came to symbolize the futility and mindless bloodletting that were hallmarks of World War I. In February, the Germans launched a massive attack against French position in and around the fortress town of Verdun, the objective was to bleed the French and hasten their surrender. However, the French determined to hang on and under the tenacious leadership of General Henri-Philippe Pétain, whose pledge they shall not pass lifted French morale, France withstood the German attack but at a terrible price. By the end of the battle, the Germans and the French had each lost 350,000 men. Later that same year, the British launched a massive attack against German positions along the Somme River. After several weeks of intense combat, the Allies had gained a mere 15 square miles at the cost of 410,000 British dead and 190,000 French dead. The Germans lost 500,000 men. The staggering number of casualties can be attributed not only to incredibly stupid strategic planning and leadership, but also to the perfection of already existing weapons of mass destruction and the introduction of new ones. During World War I, the machine gun and heavy artillery were employed with devastating effect. Weapons used for the first time included aircraft, tanks, poison gas, and submarines. Their effect was no less devastating. In particular, the submarine and its effects transcend the battlefield. At the onset of the war, both sets of belligerents declared a blockade in the belief that they could starve their opponents into submission. While the Allies relied chiefly on Britain's fleet to maintain their blockades, the Central Power placed their hopes in Germany's submarines. The German submarines were quite effective, but the type of campaign they waged was flawed because, unlike surface vessels, they could not stop and board their intended target. Rather, they could only sink their targets in an indiscriminate fashion, demonstrated quite dramatically in May 1915 with the sinking of the passenger ship Lusitania with the loss of 1,200 lives, including 111 Americans. The United States, a neutral country that had protested the blockade actions of both belligerents, erupted in anger at the sinking of the Lusitania. The United States threatened war against Germany a prospect that caused German leaders to modify their submarine campaign. However, at the start of 1917, Germany once again decided to wage unrestricted submarine warfare. This decision played an important part in the American determination to enter the war on the side of the Allies in April 1917. The only major conventional clash at sea occurred in spring 1916, when the German fleet ventured from its harbors and fought the British fleet at the Battle of Jutland. The clash was essentially an accidental one, and although the German fleet probably gained a slight victory, 
As the German guns proved better than the English ones and the Germans sank twice the tonnage that the British did, it retreated to port and never again sallied forth to challenge the British. While millions of men slaughtered each other at the front, important changes occurred at home. World War I introduced the 20th century to the concept of total war, subjected to the requirements of a war effort of unprecedented scope and size, each belligerent government eventually adopted policies that interfered profoundly with normal civilian activity in order to marshal all available human and material resources. Perhaps the best example of this development is found in the policy of national conscription that placed all able-bodied young and middle-aged men at the state's disposal. The now regimented populations were also the target of incessant campaigns of state-sponsored but often distorted propaganda designed to boost civilian morale and generate support for the war. Meanwhile, the war effort drained the financial resources of the state and eventually bankrupted almost every belligerent. Standards of living also declined, and each state struggled to find substitutes for items that were no longer available, including labor, as women performed heretofore exclusively male tasks. Germany, under the organizational genius Walter Rathenow, practiced total war most effectively. Rathenow successfully organized Germany's productive capacity and directed German scientists in the production of many ersatz, or artificial items, that served to mitigate the effects of the Allied blockade. Such steps enabled a resource-strapped Germany to fight effectively for more than four years. Those countries least successful in waging total war, like Russia and Austria-Hungary, found their chances for success, even survival, rapidly diminishing. In fact, the failure to shoulder the crushing burdens of modern warfare led to the collapse of Russia in 1917. In March of that year, revolution broke out in the capital, St. Petersburg, which had been renamed Petrograd at the beginning of the war. Nicholas II, the Russian Tsar, or Emperor, quickly abdicated, but the chaos intensified. While the situation at home continued to deteriorate, the Russian army mounted a summer offensive under General Alexis Brusilov. As had been the case in 1916 when Brusilov launched a similar campaign, he was defeated. With Brusilov's defeat, the Russian army began to disintegrate. At home, a power struggle was underway to see who would fill the vacuum created by the collapse of the Tsarist state. In November 1917, the Bolsheviks, a small radical group espousing Marxism and led by Lenin, seized power. Believing in the inevitability of a global working-class revolution, the Bolsheviks sought to withdraw Russia from the war. Negotiation ensued during which the Germans drove a very hard bargain. These negotiations resulted in the March 3, 1918 Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which validated the German victory in the East. The Germans could now devote their full attention to the Western Front, Therefore, however, circumstances had changed dramatically. Russia's departure from the war roughly coincided with the U.S. entry into the war. In the early 1917, an increasingly desperate Germany, now fully under the control of Generals Ludendorff and Hindenburg, decided to resume unrestricted submarine warfare in an effort to starve Great Britain into submission once and for all. This decision infuriated the United States, which declared war on Germany on April 6, 1917. Several months later, in January 1918, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson issued the 14 points, which for the first time clearly set out Allied war aims. Both the American entry into the war and the 14 points following closely upon the triumph of Bolshevism in Russia gave the Allies a huge boost in morale. Moreover, the prospect of unlimited American men, money, and material seemed to ensure that the Allies would eventually win the stalemated conflict. However, the United States would take about a year to move to a war footing, and the bloodletting on the Western Front continued unabated throughout 1917. The French, under a new commander, General Robert Nivelle, determined to continue the failed tactic of the massed assault. This time, however, French troops mutinied, refusing to go on the offensive. Unbeknownst to the Germans, the French army was on the verge of collapse. 
That catastrophe was avoided when Pétain, the hero of Verdun, replaced Nivelle and restored discipline. In order to save his army, Pétain abandoned the doctrine of attack and took up a defensive posture awaiting the arrival of the Americans. The British, however, continued to press forward, fighting in Flanders' fields at Passchendaele and Ypres, the British army observed staggering casualties at the hands of dug-in German forces. In October, the southern front flared when the Austrians routed the Italian army at Caporetto. Approximately 300,000 Italians surrendered, while more than 400,000 deserted. The failures of 1917 might have been enough to break the Allies had it not been for the entry of the United States into the war and the coming to power of George Clemenceau in France and David Lloyd George in Britain. These hard-nosed leaders, who sometimes rode roughshod over both their political opponents and prevailing legal standards, were determined to achieve victory. Their determination proved helpful as the war reaches climax in 1918. Freed of major military responsibilities in the East, the Germans now transferred the bulk of their forces to the Western Front as they prepared for an all-out onslaught against the British and the French before the Americans could arrive to tip the scales in favor of the Allies. Launching their massive attack in March 1918, the Germans came perilously close to success until they were defeated in July at the gates of Paris in the Second Battle of the Marne. The failure of the German offensive foreshadowed the end of the war. With American troops pouring into France at the rate of 250,000 a month, the German armies lost all chance of victory. In September 1918, the German generals informed a shock Kaiser William II that Germany was defeated and dumped further responsibility for the conduct of the war in his lap. In Austria-Hungary, the empire itself was disintegrating as each of its component national parts started to go its own way. On November 11, 1918, an armistice took effect after more than four years of the bloodiest fighting the world had ever seen, the guns stopped firing. In January 1919, peace negotiations opened at Paris. The Paris Peace Conference, as the negotiations were called, tried to deal with the many consequences of the war. However, Soviet Russia, already a pariah among nations, was not invited to the conference and defeated Germany was effectively barred from participating in the discussions. As for the victorious allies, they tended to squabble among themselves and could never agree on whether to impose a truly draconian peace or a generous peace. The main product of this flawed effort to bring peace to Europe was the Treaty of Versailles, signed on June 28, 1919, five years to the day after the assassination of Franz Ferdinand at Sarajevo. I hope you enjoyed the story of the First World War. Of course, the events were not enjoyable, but I like the lessons we learn from history, and hopefully we don't have to go through those hard times ever again. Although the world went through the World War II again, and a lot of wars and the wars that are happening all around the world, people still learn nothing, that nobody wins in the end. All these people dead, all these resources wasted, and they still wage war every day. Anyway, not to be so dramatic, that brings us to the end of Curious Apollo Episode 1. I hope you've enjoyed the things we talked about today, the questions we've answered, and the feature story of World War I. I'll meet you again with new questions, new topics next week, so stay tuned for more interesting episodes from Curious Apollo from Polo Podcast. This is Danny saying thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you next time.